I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 17th of February, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life in Nicaragua. Today, we are returning from Ometepe and we have a story to tell. We'll be back right after the bump. <laughs> If you saw today's thumbnail, you know that we had a bit of an adventure. So what was our day today? We're going to start off telling you about the day and our topic. Later on, I got asked the question, can we compare the island of Ometepe with the island of Bali in Indonesia? And I said, wow, that's really interesting. Let's do that. So we have a whole comparison that's coming that's already been recorded. So uh, I will pop that um, at the end. First, we're going to tell about the day because this is pretty interesting. This is our travel from Ometepe back home. So we started the day in Merida, Ometepe. That is an island that faces west on the eastern island because it's kind of two islands. Uh, very small village um, at the Hotel Congos. And uh, we had to get up very early. So my alarm was set for three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock and the four of us needed to make it to the ferry. It is quite some ways away. So I gave myself about 50 minutes to get up. I was up until about midnight last night working on trying to keep uploads going and stuff. It's been very challenging uh, this week, just getting everything ready so that I can edit uh, for you guys. It, like it's, it's really a lot of moving pieces to make this all happen, but very excited about getting all the footage and stuff from Ometepe and getting something so different from what we normally do. That's been great. Uh, and, and really kind of working up a pattern of how we can do this show on the road, get new places, see restaurants, do all kinds of things. So that's all pretty fantastic. Uh, on uh, so this morning had to be up at three out the door about 350 so I gave me that gave myself that time to pack all the electronics up because everything was set up during the night uploading um, and quickly brush my teeth and get all that stuff ready uh, so I was down waiting for the taxi at about 345 the taxi actually arrived just after 330 he was way ahead uh, probably because he was staying up and doing it as the last run of the night rather than the first run of his morning that's how early this was uh, and uh, it was completely dark and everything um, and it's the same taxi we've been using so he knew us, he just came and waited, uh, and that worked out really nicely. We knew he was there, and there was nothing that we had to panic about. We didn't have to worry about traffic or anything. Uh, so it was actually about 4 o'clock by the time everyone was ready. We got loaded in the taxi and got on the road. We had to stop in Moyagalpa and get cash. There's no ATMs around Ometepe, only in Moyagalpa, as far as I know, possibly in some of the other settlements. We only know of them there. We did discover that there are at least three. Um, originally, we've been told there may have only been one, but there are at least a few, but very few, right? So again, you, you do have to plan. If you're going to be on Ometepe, plan around your cash usage. Make sure you have a way uh, to get cash one way or another or have enough to work with and uh, so we uh that was actually he's like uh, we don't have any time to do this detour to an atm even though it was like one block out of the way and zero traffic is in the middle of the night he's like you got to run because like the ferry's gonna leave we're like oh boy so we got in i jumped out ran to the atm the atm had no money i walked out there's a security guard and asked him he's like no there's there's no cash in the machine it's empty I'm like oh my gosh but luckily there was another one i ran there and that one had cash so Wow, though, that so BAC had no cash, Banpro had cash, uh, and we used La Fise uh, two days ago, and they had cash. Um, but that's a real risk. Machines run out, and there's it can be half a day before they can refill it because they have to. They only have traffic for 12 hours a day, and they have to come from the mainland. So if there's a run on the ATM, it is what it is. You can't do anything about it. Uh, so uh, we got the cash and raced to the port. This is where the real adventure begins. So we did make it in time to get on the boat. We got there, we walked up to the port, and again, you just get on the boat, right? Like this is easy. So if you're on the island, you don't have to like get tickets ahead of time. You don't have to worry about anything. Just drive to the port, walk onto the boat, and then just have some cash so you can pay uh, for your ticket on the boat. They'll they'll charge you partway through. You're a captive audience. They don't have to worry about you jumping over the side or anything. If you're going to do that, like it's a free ride. Um, so, and it's worth noting that, well, we'll get to that in a second. The, so we get there and the boat is not the ferry. It is the launcher. So what they do is um, more or less alternating. I don't know how strict that is, but they take a ferry. That's the big boat with the buses. And I found a picture of the ferry that we took in 2015, and it was significantly smaller than the ferry we took the other day. So they're now running much larger ferries than they used to, and that really helps. That's partially why it was so much more comfortable. The boat was bobbing much less. There's more space to move around. There was way more seating. Like, I mean, so much more. I was really surprised by how nice it was. So the old ones were pretty small. 
The Lancia is even smaller than the old ferries. The old ferries could still take some cars. This can't take anything, like some motorcycles, some, you know, people are putting on like boxes of fruit. That was it. This was very small. It's essentially a large fishing vessel that's been adapted for passengers. It's actually designed for passengers, but very, very few. This is a small boat and it doesn't have like railings all the way around the top and stuff. So it's quite precarious. The ferry is like formal and nice. Like you feel really safe and there's not really a problem. My dog has decided to come join me. This is funny. And uh, uh, it's a completely like um, touristic experience taking the ferry. Taking the Lancia is anything but. I'm going to show him because he does this all day long. The Lancia is absolutely tiny and uh, they actually handed out life vest as we got on. So I left out the most important part. As we got there, uh, Dominica looked at it and she said, I can't do this. Like I, it's not even, it's not even within the realm of reason. There's no way that I can get onto this launch as she has uh, both a fear of boats and an extreme amount of motion sickness from being on boats. And she cannot in any way do this type of, of boat, the ferry itself, the larger ferry, not the small one that we did years ago. That was really, really rough. Uh, but the larger one that we just did was all she could do to ride that ferry and get on what was really a decently calm day from San Jorge to uh, San Jose. And uh, so the launcher was beyond out of the question. Um, so we're like, well, what do we do? Like all of us had places to go. All of us had a schedule uh, and everyone has to go to a different place. Marcella needs to go to uh, Las Penitas. I need to go to Leon. Dominica needs to go to Managua to meet up with April and Paul to do a furniture shopping trip. And Chris needs to go to Managua uh, to university. And uh, so we're all scrambling like, oh my gosh, we've all got to go. We've all got to go different places. And I said, well, uh, you have to wait for a ferry. I don't know when a ferry is going to be. They said, you know, it's not going to be too long, right? But there's there's going to be a ferry. I'm like, we're as soon as we get to the other side of the water, we all have to go different directions anyway because we're taking public transportation different places. We'll just go ahead and you can take the ferry after this. And she's like, yeah, I don't care. Just go. So Marcella and I, because we're going to the Leon route on the bus, uh, we went and took the Lancha. Dominica and Chris stayed and waited for a ferry to be available because he's not under a time crunch. So, uh, so Marcel and I worked our way onto the launcher, which was a very interesting experience. They, we sat on a bench. The bench did have a little side railing, you know, down beside me. So like, I wouldn't like slide off the end, but that's, that's all there was, um, under my feet. If you drop something, it wouldn't exactly just roll off the ship, but it, you know, the, my back was against the edge of the ship and there's nothing really stopping things from going over the edge. So I had my backpack between my feet held, clung to between my feet uh, so that it wouldn't roll back and potentially go off the side of the ship. Um, th directly next to the side of my bench was no railing. So if I was to stand up and just kind of faint, I would just go over the side of the boat. Like there's nothing, not even a railing to hold on to, let alone a railing that would stop you from going over. So that part's a little bit a little bit crazy, a little bit, uh, a little bit precarious, um, but it made it for a really interesting boat ride. And this is definitely the early morning commuting launcher. It was packed with people who were very obviously heading to work somewhere, right? And to some degree, it was people taking produce and stuff over from the island, uh, and in other ways, it was just people heading over to work. And uh, it was dark when we went, which was very bad for Dominica as well. Uh, so we actually started the ride in the dark. We saw some cool ships sitting there. You can see like the, the big, uh, big cargo ships uh, getting ready to head to Granada and that stuff. But, um, and we saw the ferry getting ready. So we knew they were not going to be too long and they were actually on the ferry before we were to the other side, but it is uh, more than an hour, just like an hour and a half journey. Uh, it was luckily it was decently calm because the launcher is so much rougher than the ferry because it's a fraction of the size. Like it's much, much smaller. There is no world in which Dominica could possibly have gotten on that launcher. It was, it was rough for us and neither of us get seasick, neither of us like anything. And it's just, it's a very small, very rough, uh, boat going across a lake that size. So that was, that was pretty interesting just doing that. And that's where our, our morning thumbnail came from. Cause even when we got on it, we're like, what, what is this? Like she's never been on a boat like that. Um, it's been a really long time since I've been on one and it, it wasn't scary, but it was, it was definitely an adventure. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind boats, if you don't have any, 
great go do that when you go to Ometepe it's uh, it makes for a good story but you have to worry about things like I wasn't able to take any video on there I could not risk taking out a camera it could fall and it was dark so it didn't matter uh, but I liked the ferry because I was able to, to really film and get beautiful smooth shots of everything uh, if you saw the last two days like, I got some really good footage um, a couple days ago when we did the ferry it looked fantastic in the launch I would have been stuck maybe I would have seen some of those good views but I you know you're stuck holding on to things you can't really move around on the ferry I could just walk all over the place do different things hold cameras take out my bag had lots of space here I was pressed up against people very 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 different experience however it is worth noting the launch is cheaper it was only about I want to say like 75 cents to get across. It was $1.40 on the ferry uh, and only like 75, maybe 85 cents uh, on the launcha. So if you're looking to pinch pennies, the launches do save money uh, and, and they all go pretty often. So uh, definitely an option. The launcha, because it was the commuting uh, boat, like I said, when we got to the San Jorge port, uh, we got off and the, there was a giant luxury bus, luxury may be a stretch, but quite luxurious, large bus waiting for us. Uh, and we just got straight on. They just want you, you walk out and they're like, Managua, Managua, Managua. And you're like, yep. And you get on the bus. Um, and I'm not sure how much it was, but in the $2 range and this big air conditioned bus, it was so cold. We had to turn off our vents, right? We were freezing on this bus. Uh, and it took us right into Managua and dropped us off uh, at Colonia Central America, which is perfect, right in the center. So it was a very short taxi ride over to the Uca bus terminal, which brought us back to Leon. Uh, on this particular uh, Uca bus, um, and they're all different, so you never know what you're going to get. You can't predict it. You can't like look at a schedule and figure it out. Uh, sometimes they charge you right as you get on the bus. Sometimes they charge you halfway. They stop in uh, La Paz Centro at Landers, um, and this time they stopped at a different place I've never been at before. It was a much bigger restaurant, um, and this was really interesting. They stopped at this restaurant, and I like when they do this. I think it's a good system. They stop. They collect your money. While they're collecting your money, a waiter count comes up, or a server, or however you want to think of it, comes up to the bus, leans in, and takes everyone's orders, right? What would you like? What would you like? What would you like? And you can look out the windows and see the menu and stuff, but this is La Paz Centro. So all the places along this route are Casillo places. And Casillos are kind of like a corn tortilla with cheese and a, and a cream sauce with onions. Um, and it, it's decently good, very cheap, um, and really, really, really messy. And they, and they sell them in uh, sandwich bags. It's the funniest experience. So since we hadn't eaten all day, we took the opportunity to order Casillos. And it's neat because he's standing at the at the bus and he, he has a, a radio. And as you order, he radios in your orders. So they're starting right away. They make these things really fast. Because remember, you're just at a bus stop collecting the money. Um, and uh, he runs up and comes back with a big basket with everyone's orders labeled, hands them out, collects some cash from you. And this is super cheap. It's like you know, a meal for $2, right? Um, and fresh made just for you. Uh, and then the bus is underway. So fast and efficient, amazing to see this happen and at just how cheap you can get this large amount of food. Um, I think I think in reality, mine was about $1.20. That's probably about what it was. And the way you eat it, you actually bite off just a little corner of the sandwich bag and you squeeze the bag and you kind of, manip it takes some practice. You have to manipulate the crema around the, the cream and get it all over uh, the tortilla in there. And then you squeeze it and you kind of bite a little bit and then you pull it out and it stretches the bag as it, as it pulls your bite out and it keeps it from being a big mess and allows you to eat it. And then when you're done, you just, all you have left is a little tiny uh, sandwich bag that you just throw away. Uh, and it, it really is a skill that you want to practice. And if you're not careful, casillos are about the messiest thing you could possibly imagine. But if you know what you're doing, everyone from Nicaragua eats these and has no problem at all. Like they just do it and they're like, what, why, why would this be a problem? And, and as an American, you're like, what are you doing? This is, this is like disaster. You're just imagining a, a bus filled with food smeared on everything and no problem at all. It, it's, it's something just to watch people eat it, let alone do it yourself. Uh, but I got one. It was quite good. I actually, it was probably one of the best ones I've ever had uh, and enjoyed that. So I always like bus food, right? I can't get enough of talking about bus food. I forgot to mention the other day, we actually, while we were on the bus heading to Ometepe, after we'd done all the snacks that I told you guys about last time, they actually came around and sold pudding parfaits on the bus. I've never seen that before. And I've seen pudding parfaits, but or, uh, I'm sorry, jello parfaits. Jello parfaits on the bus. Um, and of course, I've seen those before, like when I was a kid. At, or like in the grocery store or something, but they are actually just selling them. These are homemade ones. This is not like some pre-made thing. And uh, so we bought those and, and they were yummy. I mean, but it's what you think it is, right? It's just 
a jello parfait but it's very funny that's the thing that they sell on the bus and they're a little bit chilled and it's warm so it's a nice cool kind of desserty sort of thing to have so very interesting uh so that was our adventure getting uh back from ometepe it really was not bad at all but it did make for quite a story and a really great shot that we took the selfie of ourselves as we got onto the boat and we're like what are we doing this is this is this feels a little bit terrifying when you don't know what to expect um, and i'm sure it's more terrifying for marcella who doesn't know how to swim uh dominica and chris had no problem they got onto the ferry which was only 30 to 40 minutes after us they really weren't far behind they were able to get a bus not as easily as us but not bad uh and got to where they needed to go uh, april was not able to go shopping with dominica today but she and paul went all around uh, the um, Pueblos Blancos uh, and looking for furniture ideas. And we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to be doing. They do have to make another trip to, to get it all finalized, but they've, they've done the survey trip, um, gotten pictures for everything, and April's going to approve it remotely. She's our interior designer and, uh, and we'll be ready to go. Uh, we got back to Leon ourselves and it was still pretty early. I mean, we had left obviously ridiculously early in the morning but we were back i think before noon so it was from the time we woke up uh until back to leon of course marcella had to go farther because she was going to las Benitas, but i was home before noon uh and so that was less than eight hours from wake up to home from the time we actually got on the ferry if you were you know staying by the ferry a reasonable thing to do is time from the time you get onto the ferry uh it was around about six hours i would say because uh, we were on just before uh, six and arrived uh, just before noon and that's that's not bad for that long ferry ride the bus ride to Managua the transfer with the taxi and then the Uka bus uh, to Leon and then the taxi in Leon from uh, we use the gas station on the southeast side of town out to the house for that to be uh, only that long to go all that way uh, not bad at all and then obviously all the extra driving uh, that we had to do on the island because we stayed so far away from the port uh, before it made, so it made for a really interesting morning we didn't have a lot of time once we got back to leon i did have the afternoon where i needed to work a lot and i was really really tired having gotten so little sleep last night i really didn't want to go anywhere tonight but tonight is important and we've had this on the calendar because tonight cadejo is playing at via via and we need to go uh talk to them and see them and talk about the song lineup because so quick story, uh, a few months ago we were out and Cadejo has not been, as far as I know, they've not been together for some time and they got back together and they played at Via Via and we went and saw them and I'm like, these guys are fantastic. I love watching them play. This is such a good band. I would really love to get them to come out to um, the, where we live uh, and do a block party because we have neighbors and stuff, but there's some space available. I'm like, Let, we should have them set up and play here and invite all the neighbors and invite friends and have like a big, big party and just have Cadejo come play and have this huge thing and everyone's kind of like uh-huh uh-huh uh so for my birthday which is coming up in uh in eight days but from the time you're actually watching this it will be tomorrow um so uh dominica and marcella put together the sneaky plan to try to throw me a surprise party with cadejo playing when they said I was having a surprise party and that there was going to be a band, I was suspicious that it was going to be Cadejo because the only other band that would be a really uh, obvious choice is Larry Emerson, but he would have to come in from uh, Managua and that, that's much harder to pull off. Uh, so um, we were, uh, I had kind of guessed that they were playing, uh, but at some point they kind of had to let me know what was going on so that I could help with a lot of the planning and stuff. And so we're going to see them tonight. So uh, all afternoon worked like crazy, uh, tons of just video uploading, trying to get stuff ready so that we, cause I have no video in just, you know, 12 hours, I'm gonna be scrambling. So working really hard to get uh, some video work done and lots of catch up in the office because I've been gone. Uh, this week is a good uh, test of just how much I can be away from the office and how hard that is going to be as, uh, as we do that because there's, uh, with me being gone a whole lot, it becomes very difficult both to keep up with the videos and to keep up with work. So, but I think, I think overall this went okay. Um, and there wasn't much opportunity to do anything uh, while we were on the trip. I couldn't really upload, I couldn't really edit. I didn't have any way to transfer from the GoPro to the, so it was good. So, uh, so a very busy afternoon of work, basically no time uh, to relax whatsoever. Uh, we grabbed food before going out um, and then uh, ran out 
to go see uh, Cadejo playing at Via Via. So we had a really nice evening. Um, I was exhausted. So by the end of the show, it was all I could do to stay awake. They, Via Via closes at midnight. Most venues in Nicaragua stay open very late, but they're a hostel. And so they have a hard stop at midnight. They turn over their books, they shut everything down and the bands are done. So you can ask for all the encores you want. You are done by 1159. I was done, so I made it through the entire uh, the entire show. They were fantastic, of course. I'm really excited to see them out at the house. That's going to be so much fun, um, and I'm really hoping I'm going to be able to like record a whole bunch of that for you guys. I might even live stream. So be prepared on the 25th. I'm hoping we might do some live streaming. I don't know how we're going to pull that off yet, but maybe. And. Uh, uh, so I just grabbed a taxi and went home. I thought Dominica and Marcella were going to call it a night as well after they've been same as me, like barely any sleep for days on the trip, but both of them are party animals and so they ended up going out uh, with the band for the after party for another four hours or so. Uh, so I went home and just straight to bed. Um, I needed the sleep. Um, and very thankful that I was able to do that. Uh, but glad I went out, had a really nice time, and, and next week is going to be so much fun um, and, and great content for the show as well. So really cool. So that was my really long Friday. Um, everything went well, and uh, we're going to real quick do a little bump for an upcoming project. We're not quite ready to tell you what it is yet, but we're really close, and uh, we're kind of getting that teaser out there, and, uh, and then we're going to go on to the day's topic. All right, guys, we're trying something completely different here. I'm trying everything different. I'm inside, my doors are open, so my crazy dog is running around because she can't stand it any time I'm talking to you, even when I'm outside. I'm recording on the iPhone 13, and I'm using completely artificial light in the middle of the night. I've got my studio light on up here, and I have a spotlight on behind me. And you can see why I'm really interested in getting work done on making the studio into more of a studio. I am working on that. I don't need to go to a different space. April is helping me redesign this room, uh, and I'm planning on getting another one of these lights. I have two of the stands. You can't really see the stand, uh, but I have another stand, and I need to get another light. I wanted to test this one out. This is the 65 watt. I plan to get the 100 watt next time I'm going to be in the U.S., or if any of you are coming from the U.S., let me know. I'd love to ship it with you. Um, I need to get some more ambient lights for the back. I want to. We're going to put up a quilt on the back wall that's going to help with the audio. I'm going to uh, move the desk forward, and we hope to mount my monitors and some lights to the wall and have a uh, camera mount all here so I can sit at my desk and do videos in an organized way for you. But for now, I'm just kind of testing out some scenarios to see what kind of works. But it would be nice from time to time, especially when I'm really far behind and I need to sit at my desk and get some stuff for you uh, to be able to work at night. Because quite often this is when I have time to film the daylight hours, which I know makes the best videos, is the impossible time for me to get out and do stuff. And it, and it can end up with some really big challenges. But tonight, I've, I didn't have a topic for today. We did the what happened during the day, and I hope you found that interesting. But what we're going to cover now is the question that came up on, uh, on, the, on the, the community. Is there a good comparison between the island of Ometepe in Nicaragua and the island of Bali in Indonesia? I said, wow, this, this could be a topic. Let's talk about it. So 
what are these two islands? Let's start with that. So both of these are tropical islands, and they may seem very comparable because of that. And they're both places that generally depend on tourism as what they are at least famous for and really is the major component of both of their tourism. That also makes them seem very comparable. So starting from that, tropical islands that are based around tourism, this has got to be a great comparison, right? Everyone knows Bali from a... Um, uh, just just a world travel options perspective. Um, now, let me preface, I've never been to Bali or Indonesia in general. Um, I would love to go. That would be fantastic. Uh, I don't tend to lean towards really heavy, heavily uh, touristy locations like Bali, and that alone should give you a little bit of a what's different. Ometepe is a very minimally um, touristed place in a very minimally touristed country, whereas uh, Indonesia as a whole is not a giant uh, tourism destination, but Bali is one of the world epicenters of travel, right? It is a massive travel destination. Ometepe is in no way whatsoever. Uh, Bali has working airports and ports and all kinds of things. So uh, very, very different in that regards. So let's talk about what's different because those are the things that are the same. So first of all, Ometepe is a lake island. It is in fact the world's highest lake island. Uh, the top of Volcano Concepcion is the highest peak on any lake island anywhere in the world, so that's interesting. It is also the 10th largest lake island anywhere in the world, uh, but I believe it is the one with the highest population. That may not be true, uh, but it's up there at the very least. Um, some other countries that do have larger lake islands include Canada, the United States, and Russia. Um, uh, because of that, it is a very calm beach, like the entire feeling of the island is very different because it has shallow lake water uh, that goes out. You can walk really far out. There is no tide. There's nothing like that. You don't have the ocean. You can't have ocean-going vessels coming up to it. Bali is an oceanic island in the midst of lots of many larger islands, right? The Indonesian archipelago is enormous and is part of uh, a much bigger country group. So just from that alone, Bali has tides and cruise ships and those kinds of things. So that is very different. Now, from a uh, the country it is a part of, uh, Ometepe is an itty-bitty island part of the relatively small country of Nicaragua, which has fewer than 7 million people, quite a bit fewer. Uh, Indonesia, on the other hand, I actually don't know the number off the top of my head, but is one of the, I think it's the fifth largest country in the world at... I will have it in two seconds, 277 million people. So 277 million, making it something like 70% the size of the United States. Indonesia is most close, is, is from the United States, Indonesia is the closest country in size. That's important, right? The only two countries larger than the United States by population are China and India, the drop from those two to the United States is pretty dramatic. The United States and Indonesia sit very close to each other as the next two largest. So that's important from a size perspective. Nicaragua, at more than 6 million, is only the size of a city in one of those countries and not a large particular city uh, in those countries. So that is very different. Speaking of populations... From the island itself, the population on Ometepe, there is not a strict census. The last real strong census that was done was 2005, and at that point it was 30,000. A study was done about five to eight years ago by Walmart. They believed it was over 40,000. What we hear today is that the island has topped 50,000, which is a lot of people for the island, uh, and it is noticeable that there's so many people uh, on the island. Um, I should note that a number of times on the channel, I have said that Moya Galpa is the largest settlement on Oatepe. That is inaccurate. Uh, it is the second largest. It is, I believe, the capital. Capital. There's not really a capital because it's just an island. Uh, but the largest settlement is actually Alta Gracia, which is just a little ways east of Moya Galpa and only just a little bit larger. The two of them are very close to each other, and the two together have roughly half the population of the entire island um, in their, their little sphere between them. Um, but I, I had the wrong town. Moyagalpa is where the port is. It is what the tourists go to. It's what everybody thinks of. Alta Gracia, um, I'm sure, is also full of tourists, but not at all to the same degree. Moyagalpa is completely focused on logistics and tourists. Alta Gracia is the, where people actually live. 
So we're talking about a total island population of 50,000. Bali, on the other hand, has a population of over uh, 4.3 million, almost 4.4 million people. So much closer in size to the entirety of Nicaragua. It would be quite a bit smaller, uh, but with Nicaragua being somewhere around 6.8 million, 4.4 million is comparable at least. It's far more than half. Uh, and so 4.4 million to 50,000, that is just a crazy difference in population size. So uh, Bali is full of cities and big settlements and, and lots of infrastructure and resources. Bali has more people than Puerto Rico, for example, uh, about the same number of people as Panama, um, not that many fewer than Costa Rica, uh, that kind of thing, right? So that kind of gives you a comparison um, in just how big Bali is. Bali is large enough that it has its own ecosystem and culture to itself within the Indonesia system. Um, and it has a slightly different uh, religious de demographic and so forth. Indonesia, which is predominantly Muslim, uh, Bali is predominantly Hindu, which is really uh, interesting within the Indonesia uh, cultural thing. So Bali is a completely different place than the rest of Indonesia as a whole, just from a religious perspective. And of course, those religions heavily influence things like food and music and architecture. So uh, Indonesia, um, when people talk about going to Indonesia and they talk about going to Bali, they really talk about them as if they're two separate places, uh, just in general, just as travelers go. When we're talking about Ometepe, we always talk about it as just part of Nicaragua. It is um, culturally, linguistically, religiously, everything, just another part of Nicaragua and not even a part so large as to be its own province or anything like that. It is a small administrative piece of the small departmento of Rivas. And the distance from it to other places is only about six kilometers. We're not talking about a long distance. They can see each other at all times. If they needed to, they could run wires between pretty easily. Like you could, you know, line people up with, with rafts and, and hope it makes it, right? Like you're, you're dealing with a, 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 a plausible amount of space uh, to work with when you're, when you're dealing with things. Let's talk about the size of the islands. This as well is... Uh, a really big deal. So uh, Ometepe is 276 square kilometers. That is a very large lake island. Very large. Not the largest, but very, very large. 276. Bali is 5,780 kilometers. 5,780 versus 276. You could add Ometepe as an island somewhere inside Bali and people would barely notice. It is very, very different uh, in overall size. So from those perspectives, how big they are, how many people there are, how it fits into the world around it, um, what kind of place it is, uh, its highest point, while the highest point of elevation, uh, 1,610 meters in uh, Ometepe, is the highest uh, elevation on any lake island anywhere in the world. Yes, that's a really big deal, but the elevation on Bali is over 3,000 meters, so almost twice as high. So even from an elevation perspective, it's relatively different. To double is enough to be noticeable. It changes things a lot. Um, because of these, just uh, looking at the two islands, you're gonna have completely different feeling. Going to Bali is like going to a country. It's basically its own country, even though it's part of Indonesia. It is massive. It is enough to be its own state if it was the United States. And it would be if it was the United States, right? It would be bigger than Puerto Rico. It would be bigger than several of the U.S. states. Um, it's, it's, its own completely managed destination. If you go to Bali, you spend time in nothing but Bali. You could move there and potentially have an entire life and cultural experience within Bali. Ometepe is a tiny itty bitty space within Nicaragua. You can live there, of course, but it does not constitute its own anything. It is not sovereign. It is not its own cultural group. It doesn't have those experiences. So the feeling of one is visiting a village or a collection of small villages. The other is the sense of visiting a country. Um, and, in, and many people would argue that Bali is a country within the Indonesian collective, right? They may not be accurate, but that is a valid argument to make. Ometepe has no such claim in any way whatsoever. 
uh, also important from a tourism perspective. Ometepe, yes, it does have a high percentage of tourists, but when you go there, other than seeing tourists on scooters zipping around the towns and in a few of the restaurants, it mostly isn't that impactful. In Bali, famously, the place is just crawling with tourists. They're everywhere and it is just backpackers and uh, Instagrammers and people just photographing and droning and uh, staying in hotels and that stuff just never ends. And then there's infrastructure. On Ometepe, there are a few hotels to stay in, and finding a hotel room can be a challenge. Most of the hotels are eco-hotels or very small step-up from hostels. There are hostels, uh, but mostly what we in Europe would call pensiones. They are slightly more than a hostel, but not what you would consider a hotel by any stretch. Most shoot for the nine-room limit. That is a tax barrier in Nicaragua. You're certainly allowed to go bigger than that, but nine has a certain financial advantage over eight. Eight or 10. And so nine is a very common size uh, for smaller businesses to shoot for. So Ometepe is almost completely dominated by single family businesses catering to tourists on a very small scale with no more than nine rooms and often offering some small amount of food, but extremely limited. Bali, on the other hand, is famous for its giant multi-million dollar resorts with many, many, many rooms and incredible amounts of luxury and spa and all those things. Of course, Bali is a, a giant place with many different things and you can stay in hostels and anything you want on Bali but you there's this entire ecosystem of what people think of as being Bali that does not exist in Ometepe whatsoever and not that it couldn't exist if there was millions of dollars of investment to build those kinds of luxury hotels and put them on Ometepe could they exist in theory water supply would be a major issue right Ometepe is not designed to support those kinds of things. You would be very challenged by that, whereas Bali is so large that it's able to have water supply and, and build infrastructure for big resorts and, and deal with things like that. So in, in all those respects, I think people who are visiting both on, on a very cursory glance have this island with mountains in the tropics kind of feel and say, oh, these things could be in some way comparable to each other. But I think if we dig into the with any degree, we really quickly say these are very different places and the fact that they are both islands and cater to tourists are mostly ancillary in doing a comparison. So I hope that was interesting. Um, I'm gonna do my best to have put up some pictures and stuff. I don't, I've never been to Bali, so I'm not able to provide any of my own material on that. Uh, but uh, definitely it, it was, it caught me so much by surprise to have that question that I was like, this is an, a really interesting comparison and I wanted to get uh, this video done um, and had the opportunity to do it. So it worked out just perfectly. Thank you for that. Uh, please remember, like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me and helps pay for the lights and the cameras and the and all the action. Uh, and, uh, of course, I love it when everyone gets down and asks questions, leaves comments, talks to each other, talks to me. Um, there's so much to discuss and uh, always so many questions and things like this. It's really important, right? There's so many, like, where else do you go to ask these kinds of questions? Where do you find out? What is Omotepe actually like? Uh, that's that's very valuable uh, to have here. Uh, and of course, I don't have a lot of social media or what I do have is not as strong as what you have. Uh, so please consider posting these videos on places like Reddit, LinkedIn, um, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, uh, or sharing with your friends directly goes a really, really long way to getting the word out there and getting growth on the channel. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.